Good morning. morning. What a good looking group. (laughs) Man, you guys get better looking each week. Well, happy Father's Day to all of the fathers. You know, I was fortunate enough to be brought up by a man who loved the Lord. And he's with the Lord now. And I'll see him again, as you will. And you'll get to know him too. My dad was a wonderful man who feared God and respected God his entire life. However, Satan's got his foot in the door. That's the title of today's message. You don't have to think very long to conclude that Satan has got his foot in the door in every facet of today's society and almost all of its activities. Look at what so much of our country is celebrating today. It's not Father's Day so much as it is a day for the gay and lesbian community to celebrate their lifestyle. The purpose of this message is not to alienate or humiliate any one person or one group. I will share with you what the Bible says, which is God's instruction and his word to us. It does not, nor will I condone, any choices or lifestyles that are categorized in the Bible as sinful. Nor will I make any excuses for God's Word. God's Word is strictly, directly from God Himself. I will not water it down, and I will not compromise the message therein. When a nation changes its foundational values and begins to live in sin, ignoring conviction, when a nation celebrates sinful lifestyles, when it adopts and passes laws allowing sinful behavior to become decent, when it accepts worldly values in place of biblical values, there will be an absence of of godly presence and the blessings that accompany his presence. Why? Because carnal values are an abomination to God. Luke 16, 15, where Jesus is engaging the Pharisees, he said this, You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. An abomination is something that is detestable, greatly disliked, shameful, abhorred. What is esteemed among men these days? that lifestyle. God loves every person equally. Now stop and think about that for just a second. He doesn't love you any more than he loves me. There's no difference in the type of love that God has for every person. Absolutely the same. It doesn't fade. It doesn't grow. God's love is constant. It doesn't have anything to do with your lifestyle, your past sin, your current sin. It doesn't have anything to do with your struggles or your prejudices. God's love remains completely and totally constant. There's nothing you can do to change that. We're told in Romans 8, verses 38 and 39, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Can I get an amen? 
I think about that, you know, his love. Because for so long, I was convinced that I had to do something to earn it. Just my own kind of mind just kind of just didn't fully understand the concept that God's love doesn't change. Whether or not you steal or you're honest, whether or not you lie or tell the truth, whether or not you choose this lifestyle or that lifestyle, whether or not you drive this kind of a car or ride this kind of bicycle, live in an apartment or a big old house, it makes no difference to God as far as the love he has for you. It doesn't change. I always thought that I would have to do something extra when I was growing up to get God to love me more. It's not true. God's love is constant. Let's not forget Ephesians 5.1, which says that we are to imitate God. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. You know what that means? That means you are to love others the way God loves you. Uh-oh. That puts a little check mark in my heart because I don't have that habit of loving people constantly and not allowing that love to change. I was in a store situation where there were a couple of guys a couple days ago that ran out the store with some merchandise. I didn't love them very much because I was working in that store and I felt it was my responsibility to stop that and I didn't get the chance to do that. And they made off with three or four hundred dollars worth of tools. And what happened was I found myself greatly disliking those two guys. I don't want to use that other word, hate, but I'm telling you, that really that's that was a burr under my saddle, so to speak. That really rubbed me the wrong way. After spending 30 years in law enforcement, my natural instinct is to run after them and get them. But policy in our store is you don't do that. That was really hard for me, and even harder for me to love them without it changing because of what they did. But you see, that's how God loves you. Regardless of what you do, you can be a saint or a sinner. Well, if you're a believer, you're both. You, God has transformed your sinner into saint through the blood of Jesus. We have to try to love others like God loves us. The ultimate goal for us is holiness. God wants us to be holy. His hope is that we will all someday live a life without sin. Now that's hard to do, right? Right? Yeah. You're all saints, maybe you're all believers, but it's hard to live without sin. Even thoughts that run through our minds, we have to keep in check, right? Well, like in the beginning, Adam and Eve, prior to that dreadful day when they ate the forbidden fruit, were sinless. But once they sinned, they were sinful. They were sinners. God's Spirit, the Holy Spirit, has been given to us to come alongside us and comfort us and encourage us and keep our hearts in check. But things aren't going perfectly, are they? Not for any of us. We all have some issues. Be it at home, be it at school, be it on the, on the, on the soccer field, be it with coworkers, be it with children or grandchildren, be it with parents, whatever. We all have issues. You could almost say Satan's got his foot in the door. Well, Here's my first question of the day. When did Satan get his foot in the door? Well, initially, at the very beginning of humanity with Adam and Eve, he convinced them to do something that they were instructed not to do. 
So he got his foot in the door, uh, let's say on day one, with Adam and Eve. My second question is this. How did Satan get his foot in the door? There's a two-part answer to this. Part one is this. Deception. Remember, he possessed that serpent, that snake, that talked to Eve. That must have been weird. No other animals talked to her, but this one did. And he deceived her. But the second part to that answer is this. We have compromised. You see, you can be deceived all day long, but unless you compromise those good values, those biblical principles, unless you compromise, you won't give in to sin. You must compromise to the deception that this sin is a good thing. Deception is probably the greatest weapon Satan has. Revelation 12.9 says this, and by the way, unless you didn't already know, I will always be quoting from the New King James Version unless otherwise stated. Revelation 12.9 says this, So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Guess where Satan lives? Planet Earth. Guess where all of those angels that followed him and wanted to be a part of this revolt live? Right here, planet Earth. You don't think we're fighting a battle? A little segue into next week's message, which is called War Robe. Not the ward robe in your closet, but war robe. Come next week if you want to hear that one. Ladies and gentlemen, Satan deceives the whole world. Sin is deceiving in and of itself. Let me tell you a little story about deception. Maybe you've heard it. This is how an Eskimo kills a wolf. First, he coats his knife with animal blood and then he allows it to freeze. Later, he adds another coat of animal blood and allows it to freeze. And he does this several times in that sequence until the knife blade is completely concealed by frozen blood. The Eskimo then very carefully affixes the knife to some sort of stake or something that he can put in the ground so that the blade points up. What happens at that point is the unsuspecting wolf approaches, and as he smells the blood, he is drawn to the knife. He's unable to resist the urge of that blood, and he begins to lick the blood off the knife. As he continues to lick the razor-sharp knife, he unknowingly makes his way through the blood to the edge of the knife and continues to lick, slicing his own tongue and licking his own blood. The wolf continues to feed his unquenchable thirst for blood with his own, and then he won't stop until he bleeds himself to death. You see, the wolf was deceived into thinking he was feeding himself when in reality he was killing himself through deception and self-destruction, an urge that it couldn't resist. Sin is packaged very much the same way as the knife was packaged with animal blood. Sin is a very attractive and tasteful thing, but it is deceptively destructive. Why? Because sin removes you from the presence of God, just like 
that prideful thought that Satan had that got him kicked out of heaven. Sin removes you from the presence of God. Isaiah 59.2 says this, Your iniquities have separated you from God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear you. Translated into simple English, if you're sinning, God doesn't want to be a part of you at all. At all. God has no part of sin. He's holy. He's pure. God doesn't deal with sin well. He throws it out. And so if you're living a sinful lifestyle, don't expect God to hear your prayers. Don't expect God to hear your petitions. Read Isaiah 52, uh, 59 2 for yourself. Tell me what you think. If you live a sinful life, if you have sinful habits that you keep going back to, don't expect God to listen to your prayers. Satan gets his foot in the door by deception because the Bible says so. Satan's deception includes getting you to think self first is better than serving others. And I personally want to thank everybody who is working in Vacation Bible School this next week. And I mean this so sincerely. God bless you from the bottom of my heart. And I pray that God will return those blessings to you tenfold because those children need to hear about Jesus. Amen. Satan's deception includes trying to get you to downplay or ignore your spiritual gifts. By the way, what are your spiritual gifts? You need to know what they are. You need to study them in the Bible. And you need to ask God to reveal them to you if you don't know. Doesn't matter what your age is, young or old, black or white, doesn't make any difference who you are, where you live, or any, you need to ask the Lord, please reveal my spiritual gifts to me so that I can use them for the glory of God. Amen. Satan's deception includes getting you to trust in money and the false security that it offers. Satan's deception includes getting you to think about your child or grandchild's soccer game or baseball game, and that it's just more important than Sunday morning worship. Let me tell you something. They just, they just built a soccer field, what, oh, maybe just six or eight blocks away from our house. And Sunday mornings, the place is packed. And they have, they have this overflow parking, and they fill that up too. That's where most of today's families try to go for joy, go for fun. Church isn't important to them anymore. And, and it's, it's amazing how many parents prioritize the soccer game for their child over church. Soccer game isn't going to get you to heaven. Church isn't going to get you to heaven, by the way. Only salvation through Jesus Christ. Satan's deception includes rushing you in the morning so that you don't take that 5 or 10 or 15 or 20 minutes to sit down and read and meditate on God's Word. I don't have enough time this morning. I'll get to it later. Have you ever told yourself that? I have. Not true. You've got you to make time for, for the Lord for me, it's in the morning. And let me tell you why. When I wake up in the morning, my mind is fresh. Right now, I'm real dull. I'm, I'm worn out right now. Not really. But, but I'm like, I, I mean, my mind is like a sponge in the morning. I'm, I'm more alert after I've had my cup of coffee. I'm just saying, morning time is a great time to have your quiet time. Now I say that, and I have, to, I have to tell you that when I was in high school, I started to have a quiet time, and it was always before I went to bed. And it worked for me that way, for a while. And it was okay because it worked. Whatever works for you, make sure that you have an allotted time slot for Jesus every day. Morning, noon, or night, you have a time that you can set aside every day. You do. 
Don't tell me you don't. You do. You can make time for Jesus every day. Make sure it's consistent. Satan's deception includes trying to convince you that your, your lunch period should go really five or ten minutes longer than your employer says it should because you've worked so hard. You deserve it. That's his deception. He's got his foot in the door when you lie or stretch the truth or you're not completely honest with your spouse or your friend, your sister, your brother, your neighbor, or your employer. Satan's deception includes encouragement. Oh yeah, you heard me right. Satan's deception includes encouragement. He encourages you to buy things you can't fully afford. A nicer car, a bigger home, clothes, uh, monthly payments that overextend yourself, you know. You know what I'm talking about. A little bit of financial hardship means, guess what? He's deceived you into, into, into the inability you can't pay your tithe. Mm, tithe? Well, you know, Scott, that's between me and God. That's, that's none of your business. Yeah, it is. Because the Bible makes it our business. We are to tithe. And I'm not talking 10% of the leftover. I'm talking 10% before taxes. 10% of your gross income belongs to the Lord. You know why so many Christians have financial issues because they're trying to live on 98% of their income. You were not designed to live on anything more than 90% of your income. Did you know that? God commands believers to give a tenth, to bring it back into the Lord's house so he can funnel it into ministries. You were designed to live on 90% of whatever you make. You might be making 2000 a month. You might be making 10000 I don't know. It doesn't matter. You're designed to live on 90% of your income. Now, if you can find any verse in the Bible that counters that, please let me know. I've been looking for one. Can't find it. We are designed, as believers, to tithe 10%, the first 10%, of our income. He has commanded us to be faithful in this area. I would argue that Satan also has his foot in another door. Do you happen to know which one that is? It's the door of hell. The door that opens to the everlasting lake of fire. Remember what Jesus said in the book of Matthew when he was speaking to his disciples on the Mount of Olives? Chapter 25, verse 41 says this, Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Now I want you to notice something very special about that verse. Matthew 25, 41. The everlasting fire was not initially prepared for unbelievers. It was prepared for Satan and those who followed him and got kicked out of heaven because of their pride. However, however, unbelievers, those who do not accept the gift of eternal life in Christ and have their heart circumcised with that carnal peeling off and what's left is a heart for God. That's Christianity, not lip service. Lip service doesn't get you into heaven. You heard me right. Lip service, saying something, doesn't get you into heaven. The conversion, the baptism of your heart the baptism of your mind, the changing of your ways gets you into heaven if it's in Christ. Amen. Here's an important concept. God doesn't accept lip service. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that lip service will save you. You see, when it says be saved and baptized, it means, yeah, 
we're supposed to be immersed. But baptism is a changing of the heart. Baptism is a changing of who you are. And if that change doesn't take place, there is no salvation. Salvation comes through Christ. We're saved by grace through faith, and that not of ourselves. We're saved by grace through faith. How does Satan get his foot in this door? The door of hell. The door of the everlasting, eternal fire. It started with pride. Don't you remember last week when I read to you from Isaiah 14, where he said, he being Satan, said, I will be like the Most High. That was his ambition. And that got him kicked out. Don't allow pride to step in the path of your Christianity. 1 Peter 5, 5 reminds us to clothe ourselves with humility. Uh Uh-oh. That means I have to swallow that pill called pride. Yeah. Others first, not me first. Serving, not always taking. Swallow that pill of pride and clothe yourself with humility. 1 Peter 5.5 5. Last week I challenged you regarding your ambition. What is your ambition? And I admonished you to live out your faith with conviction, not as a charade. We have to be authentic Christians. This week, the challenge is this. Even though it's tempting, don't lick the knife coated with sin. It's self-destructing. Don't allow Satan to get his foot in the door of your Christianity. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope that all of you are believers, but there may be an exception in the room. I don't know. I don't know you that well. I've only been here a total of three weeks. This week, last week, and one week in May. If you're not a believer, I would strongly encourage you to talk with me or another Christian that you respect about salvation. It's imperative that you don't put that off. It's imperative that you prioritize Jesus in your life. Like I said, the title of next week's message will be War Robe, and I'm sure you'll want to hear it. Thank you for allowing me to come and share with you this morning. I'm looking forward to next week. Will you pray with me? Father God, we are eternally grateful for the salvation that is offered through Jesus. We are eternally grateful for the sin that you have forgiven us for. Father, thank you for being our Father. I realize, Lord, that there are probably several people, either in this room or watching online, that have not had a good father experience. There may have been abuse. There may have been rage or anger. There may have been some very bad things that happened. Lord, teach us how to forgive others like you forgave us. Teach us, Father, how to love others like you love us. Teach us, Father, how to imitate Jesus like we're instructed to do in Ephesians 5. We thank you, Father, for your word, how it speaks to us, how it convicts our hearts. And Father, I want to pray especially for those who may not have made a decision yet for Christ. I pray, Father, that they would have the boldness to either come to me or to a Christian that they respect and talk to them, talk to me about making that decision that will change their eternity. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for who you are. And I just pray that you would usher us through this week with discernment and wisdom 
so that we can live according to your will. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.